Good, on, good morning, everyone from Bharat. Welcome to the discussion on safeguarding India's democracy and civil society, countering the China challenge. My name is Kalpana Pandey, a research associate at Indic Researchers Forum. Indic Researchers Forum is a security think tank focusing on issues pertaining to national security and geopolitics. A recent report by Microsoft Threat Intelligence reveals that China may use artificial intelligence generated content to manipulate general elections in India, South Korea, and USA. Though the chances of it impacting the poll results remain low, however, an increasing Chinese involvement in such activity remains a cause of serious concern for democracies and open societies around the world. To discuss the China challenge for Indian democracy and civil society, we are honored to have Lieutenant General P. R. Shankar Sir and Cleo Pascal Nam. Lieutenant General P. R. Shankar is retired Director General of Artillery. He has held many important command, staff, and instructional appointment in the Army. He has vast operational experience, having served in all kinds of terrain and operational situations, which has confronted the Indian Army in the past four decades. Major 155mm gun projects like Dhanush, M777 ULH, and K9 Vajra, rocket and missile projects related to Pinaka, Brahmos, and Grad BM221, surveillance projects like Swati, WLR, and few ammunition projects came to fructification due to his relentless efforts. He gave great impetus to the modernization of artillery through indigenization. He is now a professor in the Aerospace Department of Indian Institute of Technology, Badras. Welcome, sir. Thank Next, you. we have Cleo Pascal, ma'am. Yes, sir. Next, we have Cleo Pascal, ma'am, who is non resident senior fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies, focusing on the Indo Pacific region, in particular the Pacific Island and India. She has testified before the US Congress, regularly lectures, and moderate for seminar for the US military, and has taught at defense colleges in the United States. United Kingdom, India, Canada, and Oman. From 2006 to 2022, she was an associate fellow at Chatham House, London, where, among other responsibility, she was research lead on the multi-year future project, Perspective on Strategic Shift in the Indo-Pacific 2019-24. She is widely published in the academic and popular press. Currently, she is the North America Special Correspondent for the Sun Sun Sunday Guardian India newspaper. Before I pass the floor, I would request the audience to kindly turn off their microphone and write their question in the chat box. Now, I request Lieutenant P.R. Shankar, sir, to take forward proceeding of the session. Sir, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, it's indeed an honor for me to be uh, called over for this particular uh, web discussion on countering China and safeguarding our democracies. And this is a uh, overall, I think the concept is very nice and broad. And we all know that China uh, uses its three warfare strategies and influences people and democracies and elections. And this is the right time for it to do whatever it wants to do. Right. The second thing is India is going through its own elections. Like it has been rightly brought out, the chances of China influencing Indian elections are pretty bleak. Uh, for the simple reason, China did try to influence the Taiwanese elections. Everyone says uh, Mr. Uh, William Lai Ching Te won the Taiwanese elections, but who lost the Taiwanese election? It was China. Right? So that's the way I look at it. But notwithstanding that, they will carry out their influence operations. They will impress upon civil society, which in India, for many reasons, the is vulnerable to all this. After all, we have to remember that we have a communist government in Kerala. We had a communist government in Tripura, as also West Bengal, till a few years back. And we also had left-wing extremism you know, gripping our country in large swathes. Plus the fact that China and Pakistan have a collusive outlook, especially regarding uh, the Northeast. Uh, I mean, not, not the Northeast, sorry, the JNK. And then there's always strife and the uh, ongoing strife and uh, unsettled Northeast where China can uh, do a lot of damage to India, its civil society. And I would go to the extent of saying 
the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the nation. So we have to discuss all this in this framework. But before I give my thoughts out further, I'd like uh, to invite uh, Mrs. Uh, Claire Pascal to give her views because I think her views, looking at it from outside, are important. One. And two, she's been a uh, voice whom I've always respected and with a lot of reason, uh, logic. And actually, I look forward to her views. Once she puts her views across uh, on this entire subject, I'll put my views across and then maybe we can have a question for each other. Uh, Madam, over to you. Thank you very much, General. This is a, a, a huge and daunting uh, honor. Um, uh, I've learned uh, an incredible amount from uh, the way India has handled the unrestricted warfare that China has uh, launched against it. Um, and uh, just just to give sort of some concept of how I've how I've seen it, um, we were talking before starting about the the effect of Galwan, and um, of course the the first major visible response to Galwan launched by India was the banning of the 59 apps, including TikTok and WeChat, which which are, th those are political warfare weapons. And those are things that uh, other countries haven't managed to do. The US, they're still debating it. I'm in Washington at the moment. They're still debating whether or not to ban TikTok or, or not. And from that time on, it became very clear that yes, uh, China's got this unrestricted warfare approach to trying to degrade um, India in large part because India is actually an existential threat to the Chinese Communist Party. India puts lie to all of the justifications that the Chinese Communist Party has for its existence. And if you if you think about what are China's goals, the number one goal, because China is actually what we're talking about, the Chinese Communist Party, is the preservation of the Chinese Communist Party. The second goal is to be number one in the world in terms of comprehensive national power, which we can talk about later if you're interested. But the 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 legitimacy of the party is critical. And um, the justification for the Chinese Communist Party rests on things like it takes an authoritarian regime to run a country of over a billion people. Well, right next door, you have a country of over a billion people that's a democracy and it's doing fine. Or you need an authoritarian regime to have economic growth for a country of over a billion people. Right next door, you have India, which is in fact, growing more than China. Or uh, the Chinese will say, you know, we've got uh, problems with uh, religious minorities and we're going to put a million in concentration camps. Uh, India has a very different approach uh, to a pluralistic society and ups and downs, but definitely um, a much better place to be. So all of these elements of... Um, the justification for the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party are undermined by the mere success of India. So this is just to uh, give an example of why the attack on, on India's democracy and on the success of India is actually quite a high priority for the Chinese Communist Party. And the fact that uh, India has managed to uh, not only resist but counter has been something that um, I, I learn from on a regular basis and uh, sp speak to others about. So yes, um, after Galwan, you had the banning of the apps, and of course, then you had the countering by the Chinese for things like the attack on the Mumbai electrical grid, the um, uh, reinvigoration of the Maoists, the attack on the iPhone parts manufacturing plant, all of the all of these kind of unrestricted warfare attacks to try to um, uh, degrade India from the inside and to break India's relationship uh, as with other countries, but also in the concept of being a, a supply possibility for redirection of supply chains. Um, but India went after Xiaomi, went, did the money laundering, it did the, FB, the foreign direct investment stuff. It's been um, a master class in how to um, protect yourself from this comprehensive national power push through a comprehensive national defense. 
So um, I don't I I don't really have much to add. At the, I'm Canadian, so I, I apologize. Um, at this at this very moment, there is an inquiry going on in Canada into foreign interference into Canadian elections. And there have been very concrete examples of Chinese interference in Canadian elections, um, which is not something that all the, all the examples they're giving are not things that would be happening in India. So uh, I'm certainly not not here to 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 uh, um, uh, criticize in any way what India has been doing. I'm I'm here very much to learn, and in in that spirit, I'd like to uh, hand it back over to you, uh, sir, to um, tell me what I need to know. Well, uh, uh, let me put it this way: I think you brought out a couple of very important points, which everyone must understand uh, that. China is, or rather, India is an existential threat to China, which is very important from an ideological point of view. Which you, of, why? Anything which China does is political in nature. Their end game is politic political, and their ultimate goal is to keep CCP in power. If that doesn't happen, nothing else matters. To that extent, and they have been selling this story of. Their model of you know, governance is the best for people and for growth and to prosper in the world. And that is the model which they are trying to impose on the world through their Sinocentric world order, which Xi Jinping, even in his 20th Party Congress, has spoken of global governance with the China's model. And he's reiterated it in the uh, two sessions last month. So to that extent, India poses a existential threat i couldn't agree with you more right now the second point which you made of banning tiktok and other apps which is something which only india has done and no one else has done no one else has had the capability or i won't say capability they have all had the capability has not had the will to put it through right it is not only this it is only india which has put maximum bans or rather restricted chinese investment in another country. We've done that in a big way. The, in fact, off late, we are driving Chinese companies away from India. Most of the companies are they're crying, like Vivo, Xiaomi, and all that. Because there have been huge uh, fines slapped on the money laundering system they generated, and they've been taken to task. And this is something, again, which is not happening uh, you know, outside. And I fear the Chinese are used, make, exploiting the Mexican route to get into USA by, you know, circumventing NAFTA or rather using NAFTA. So that is something which whether China will be, whether USA will be able to ward off China through that route is to be seen, the, whether the US politics will be able to do that. But then in India, one is very clear what is happening. So I'll get back to the issue of threat to China. And one has to look at it from a slightly different perspective. If you see the Chinese growth over the past 40, 50 years, it has grown with a lot of tailwinds from the West and from USA in particular. And China from 1979 has enjoyed a peace dividend which uh, has not happened for many countries. In fact, the only two other countries which are in this bracket of economy are Germany and Japan, which also were aided by USA to reconstruct their economy post the Second World War. And that's why they are at that level in the top five economies of the world. You contrast it with India. India has gone through multiple sanctions from USA till as late as, you know, even now the last purchase we did from uh, Russia, S-400 is under some kind of uh, sanction or rather they've been talked of it. Mm. We've had to go through all wars. We've never had a peace dividend. So we've had headwinds on our economy, right? And we have had so many other things. Despite this, India finds itself today fifth or fourth, whichever way you look at it, as one of the top economies in the world. And China is, of course, second. There's no doubt about it. So there's a problem with China is facing. How is it that India, with all its plurality, with all its chaos, with all its different kind of political uh, kind of a thinking, 
right and the social setup which is quite fractured still is able to reach this level and where a monolith china right uh, with a unitary form of government and a unitary form of thinking is not able to do it and it is when you look at it from that construct you find that china does face a great threat on that i have never had a doubt right and it is on this fact i would like you to comment uh, I, because i don't know whether you looked at it from this point of view uh, so your views on this kind of a theory which i am trying to put across yeah so so this is uh it, it's veering a little bit into the philosophical um but one of one of the looking at it from a different point looking at it from the chinese perspective um one of the and, and you and you very rightly centralize this around the chinese communist party so when i talk about china i'm talking about the chinese communist party um they need obedience and um it's a it's a structure just for designed for uh submission and for obedience right that fundamentally but the things that give people a sense of self and inner strength um are often their faith and their family and a sense of freedom those those three things but particularly the first two are the latitude and longitude of m- most human beings they they um give you a sense of what's correct behavior um you know w- where you're trying to head in life how you're dealing with the people around you the chinese communist party find find faith and family to be in direct competition to obedience to the party and so they have deliberately tried to destroy faith and um, all all faith any any from i mean it could be falun gong or it could be uh the uyghurs or it could be christians whatever anybody of faith is a threat to the chinese communist party because your loyalty isn't to the party and through the one child policy they destroyed family so you have a generation of people who have no brothers or sisters they don't they don't know how to share they they haven't grown up um with that push and pull that you get in an extended family system uh in india for example so most of the world and we saw this very clearly with the g20 um m- most of the world as individuals live much more like an indian would live where they have the family is very important their faith and it could it doesn't have to even be faith in religion it could be faith in community but just something bigger than yourself is re- is really shapes your environment and that's why i think you saw such a positive response to um to the G20 meeting in India how you know, you really saw it in place like bringing in the african union you know there was a real a genuine uh warmth to this uh this other way of doing things not the western way of doing things and not the chinese way of doing things but a way that is very uh human centric and that i uh, talked about this before but that whole concept of the world is one family you know family is not easy family is is complicated and hard and uh, you don't necessarily love or like all your family but you're 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 stuck together so you've got to make it work and um that is a very different vision than the one that the chinese communist party is offering and i would argue it's a much more human one and so um you know you can have these centralized authoritarian these dictatorships but they're very brittle and they're they're dependent ultimately become dependent on in- increasing authoritarianism and control and uh once that control slips it can uh crash very quickly but what you what you described is kind of as chaotic or pluralist that's actually what that means is it's adaptive 
it can it, it can adjust there's room for movement it can breathe i mean it's the very nature of democracy um and it it's it might be it might be slower to get where it's going but it's much more ultimately stable so so for, for me just from the way that, that this the way that that you're framing it that's that's how i see it is um it, again this is a, a really this is a fundamental clash of world views and um i i would argue one of them is this sort of institutional um authoritarian fundamentally un unhuman unnatural uh way of of structuring a society that that doesn't bring the best out of its own population and uh whereas i think this the other model that's being presented and exemplified by uh by india in this context is ultimately uh it's not only morally right or morally better it it just it it works it's much more human so yeah. that's how i would see it yeah i think you brought up some very good points and the first thing is about the point that this is a nation which doesn't have brothers and sisters mm -hmm. i mean look at the lopsided nation of this nation which doesn't the whole nation doesn't know what a brother a sister or a aunt or an uncle is so it puts a huge uh, you know embargo on the very fundamental concept of a family because one part of a family is completely missing i mean i can't think of growing up without a brother and a sister i couldn't have or i can't think of my children growing without brothers and sisters and we i think talk of children in plural most chinese don't talk of children they talk of only child so there's a huge societal fracture which is on the cards the way i look at it and then of course you highlighted the inclusive nature of india and how we took the g20 along and how we took the australian i mean the african union in fact the african union president went as far as to say that india is a superpower well that leave that metaphor aside what you actually highlighted is china with it has is socially fragile at this point of time and as it increases its social fragility its authoritarianism is going to increase and if you actually cold heartedly look at china the way they think they're going about things they're looking at trying to replace uh, usa in, at one level and also trying to contain india at the other level because these are the two major countries which actually pose a threat to the chinese model and their chinese destiny so how do you think this will pan out how do you think authoritarian china will try to tackle both usa and india because at the point at this point of time it is worried that you know the india us strategic relationship is growing despite all odds and ends and it is trying its best to keep both apart and try to trying to deal with each independently mm -hmm. yes and and they're using they're they're trying to create fractures in the relationship and what china is very good at doing is identifying real grievances and then exacerbating them and then leading you to the wrong conclusion so you know you can have a a problem just as a complete hypothetical with an ambassador who may not be saying all the right things and then that can be blown up through social media if they have access to your social media to try to say that this is this ambassador represents that entire country and so you need to um close the door on that entire country or vice versa um so they're they're very good at that but Indian diplomats are highly sophisticated and they they know that for example uh if you're dealing with the United States there are a lot of different United States state department is different than department of defense uh which is different than the american people which is different than congress there's a, a lot of different um united states um and and those relation those uh, there are a lot of other relationships that are very strong um 
uh, we spoke a bit about the strength of, of Indian, India society. I am, um, and, and yes, you know, the U.S. is a big threat. Taiwan is, of course, also a big threat. Just, I mean, the ge geography of Taiwan is a big issue, but also it shows that ethnic Chinese do even better under uh, freedom Democracy, than they do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so from an from an ideological perspective, Taiwan is a is a threat. But you, you mentioned Mexico, and um, so the 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 very big concern here i'm in washington at the moment is who's coming across that border right i mean that the there are millions of people now in the in this past administration that have come into the us uh, undocumented and the um the military aged single male chinese with military haircuts who seem to have a lot of disposable cash to come in um, through different routes um, is, I mean, these are very large numbers and um, they're disappearing into, in, into the country. And uh, I was at a, a presentation this morning uh, which discussed the origins of the United Front work that um, China's been doing since the 20s. They they were they they were trained by the Bolsheviks to uh, do this kind of infiltration work. And one of the things that they did very successfully was they put uh, the the communists put people into low levels of the nationalist Chinese army, and they slowly rose through the ranks. And in some cases, they didn't have any touch with their commanders for decades. And then when the time came, they took their entire unit off the battlefield. They they flipped their whole unit. They took them all off. So the idea of infiltration, getting into the systems and lying dormant until the time comes is something that has been very successful for the Chinese Communist Party for a very long time. And we're starting to see uh, indications of that sort of a thing potentially popping up. So I mentioned in Canada, um, one of the cases that came up at this at this hearing was uh, there was one uh, electoral riding, which is a very safe Liberal Party seat. So the the elect the election wasn't as important as the primary, where where the candidate for the Liberal Party is chosen, because whoever was chosen as that candidate would undoubtedly be elected and in that uh, that election for who the candidate would be you didn't have to be a canadian citizen and so they had they bust in chinese international students to come into that riding to vote for the preferred candidate of the chinese communist party effectively that's what came out in this hearing so um I'm I'm extremely concerned about what's happening uh, at a uh, operational and societal level. And just the other quick thing is uh, what's happening with fentanyl, with the Chinese fentanyl on the streets in the U.S. is fentanyl last year in the U.S. killed over 70,000 Americans. That's more than the Vietnam War in one year. And the numbers are going up. And um, the, the Chinese could turn it off. There's, they don't, China doesn't have a fentanyl problem. They could turn it off. And the precursors are going, uh, uh, they're running through the uh, Chinese organized crime structures. And that's another element of the Chinese Communist Party's operations is using uh, criminal elements as effectively shock troops in, um, in moving forward their uh, operations. So I'm much more concerned about what's happening in the US actually at a societal level than uh, and how China is um, and other countries, but specifically China is running amok. We can see it again with this TikTok stuff uh, than I am with India. I'm very, very concerned actually. Yeah, actually you brought up something very important. How China can infiltrate at the societal level and break societies. Mm -hmm. And the example of 
the human infiltration through the migration which is happening across the southern border of USA and the fentanyl is a major problem, there's no doubt. And I think USA has to find new solutions to this old problem because this is not new. The problem is not new. It's only the borders which have changed and the, the drugs which have changed. Earlier it used to be meth, today it is fentanyl. Right. Let me get back because most of our young audience would be more interested in the China-India con uh, mm -hmm. construct. Oh, as you see China becoming more authoritative and being more inventive in the way it can infiltrate and subvert other societies and the way India is constructed, how do you see this going forward? Especially in view of the fact as India is rising, China is declining. And it, China, there's a clear need to contain India. And as late as yesterday, I saw a tweet by Global Times, which say, which has, you know, which emphasizes why Elon Musk should not invest in India. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these activities are going on. So how do you think China will approach this issue? And how do you think India should ward it off? Um, so uh, the that overt stuff, the China Times stuff, it's help. It's helpful because it tells, it gives you an indication of what they're where they're targeting. But their use of proxies can be quite effective. Um, so uh, th that's you know, and and remember that you know the book Unrestricted Warfare by by the two PLA Air Force colonels, right? It actually mentions twenty four different or over twenty four different warfares. And I, I would be, I, I think that India domestically, you have an extremely good strategic community and you're tracking it very closely, um, but they will try to hit you off the sides. So that's the sort of thing like putting out the counterfeit Indian medicine in Africa to try to discredit uh, Indian pharmaceuticals. Um, the, um, uh, S s blowing up stories about um, Indian corruption or criminal activity, which may or may not be accurate. The kind of trying to discredit uh, India and to isolate India because the, the um, coalition that India is putting together and that we saw so clearly in the G20 um, is, a, is a mortal blow to China's concept of, of making itself the middle power. And, um, you know, it's, it may, I, IMEC, the Indian Middle East Europe Economic Corridor, was um, a very elegant uh, solution to a lot of problems. But any solution that you put forward, anything you try to build, will be a threat to the CCP. So they will try to attack it. So anything that you build, anything positive that doesn't have a defense component to it um, is vulnerable. And, you know, IMEC comes up and then Gaza blows up. And then, you know, where's IMEC? It has to, it has to wait for that to resolve. You know, so I think that it, Gawan was a head-on strike and it failed. And then you started to see a lot of, um, it wasn't new, but it was increasing um, kind of, you know, uh, proxy or unrestricted warfare type attacks, like the grid and all that sort of stuff. But you will increasingly see it externally as well. I think um, India had a big advantage um, until, until Galwan, which was that the Chinese underestimated you. You know, if you look at the book Unrestricted Warfare, again, they go deep into Clausewitz and like they look at all the all the European and all the Western strategists um, and all the Chinese strategists. And they, they don't mention or the Arthur Shastra. They don't like there's nothing like the whole Indian strategic um, uh, huge body of knowledge was, was is, is invisible. And so um, they underestimated uh, India. I mean, as you say, India has been at war since it was born. I mean, it, it has uh, extremely, uh, extremely good war fighters and strategists. Um, they, there's been, you know, up and down on the political side, but India has been 
capable of doing it if given a chance. And um, the fact that you were underestimated by China gave you some maneuvering room. But after Galwan, I think less so. And now you're you're starting to see more of an of I think they've probably dedicated more people to try to figure out how to uh, contain India, which doesn't just mean domestic. It also means in Africa, in uh, other parts of Asia, and uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, in fact, if what you outlined is, if anything, the threat from China has increased post Cold One, mm -hmm. and the issue of the differential between India and China closing on many many fronts. Right. I, I, I mean, those of us who are used to the fact that China's GDP is four times that of India and all that, that's the standard claptrap which comes out of China. But when you look at it from the Chinese prism, Chinese talk of the comprehensive national power. When you look at the comprehensive national power of China and when you look at the comprehensive national power of India, I don't think there's much difference. Because like you rightly said, they've underestimated the inherent strength of India as part of being its comprehensive national power. Well, uh, having said all this, uh, very clearly the threat is increasing uh, from China as India rises for many reasons. Okay, it is my thinking that India and China are entering into a Cold War. While the world is focused on a different Cold War between China and USA and uh, some sort of grouping forming between Russia, Iran, China, North Korea on one side, the Western construct on the other side. There is also Cold War brewing between India and China. Your views on that. I would, I'll be more than interested uh, in your views. With, and I'll factor them in tomorrow when I'm going to do my discourse on Ghana short. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I think you're obviously right. And again, one of the big things that happened with Galwan was the coming together of the population and the strategic community to see it to see it in a similar way. So if you're going to have a, a cold war, uh, the population needs to understand what's going on. And in the case of India, I think the population is very on board with it. Um, and they, they uh, understand this, uh, this threat and um, it's made a huge difference. Um, uh, I think also, odd as it sounds, I think India's success at the G20 also was uh, a big flag for uh, for China. You know, India India can do things that China can't. You know, it it can connect to other countries in ways that are much less threatening. For their um, for their strategic communities um, that can deliver in development in ways that aren't so incredibly socially destructive. Um, you know, we I, when we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI. You know, that's actually BRI could also stand for Bribery and Repression Initiative, <laughs> right? Yeah, because that's what they're exporting. They're exporting the system that they have domestically of of corruption and repression. So that's not how India is seen. And um, so I, th I think that as India starts to show itself more, and that very much includes the Indian population, there's a, yeah, I, I've been lucky enough to be going to India for a very long time. and um the uh and young indians have um a casual self confidence in their eyes that is uh quite glorious to see actually you know you have you really have to prove yourself to them now and um that's that shows and it's it's also it, it attracts people to you you know, when you when you see um, a, a young country doing well, working hard and innovating and just trying to get on with life, 
in a in a context of normalcy you know where where you have your families and you have all this other stuff you know it it it, it draws people to you um so that um that is a huge threat to the chinese communist party i mean it really is so the cold war um uh I mean, I do. I do think it's increasing, and it's partially because India is starting to come into its own, um, but also because China is starting to see how other people are seeing India, and that's um, m making them take India a lot more seriously. Apart from just, I mean, you were not neighbors, right? You weren't neighbors until China ate Tibet. So this is this is a new uh, way of thinking about each other, um, which India has definitely done now. And it took a while, but it's gearing up. And as you you know, as you're talking about the infrastructure and things like that, China can't it can't ignore or threat deflate on India anymore. Um, so, and, and, and the, and, you know, U.S., I don't know what's going to happen with the U.S., I don't know what's going to happen with Europe, but the trajectory of India is rising. So if you're thinking 20 years or 30 years down the line and you're the Chinese Communist Party and you're thinking about 2049 and you're going to be the center of the universe and all that sort of stuff, uh, the, um, the horse coming up from the inside um, is India. Yeah, I think so. And I think you summed it up beautifully. And I think we'll leave it at that and we'll hand it over back to our interlocutor. who will, any questions you have, please shoot, we'll answer them. Those of you attending. Uh, so we do have some questions. Yeah. Kalpana, you are there. You can take the question from the chat box. Sure, sir. Uh, first question we yeah. have is, we talk about elections in India. The major focus is on the general elections, which is valid. However, what about the simultaneous state elections happening in India's eastern sector in the state of Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh? How does China take advantage of this? And does a recent renaming and even claiming some names are similar to Indian official names like Tatsing Ta or 30 locations have any linkages. Okay, let me take this on because it will be unfair for this question to go to Cleo. Uh, look, this will have absolutely no... Okay, let me put it in a different manner altogether. China cannot interfere with Indian elections at all. The first thing which I must tell everyone is that China tried to interfere in Taiwanese elections and it lost. Like I said earlier, uh, Honorable William Ling Ch uh, Cheng Te Lei has won the Taiwanese elections and China lost the elections. So that's the way I look at it. China cannot, because China doesn't understand Indian elections for many reasons. Even I don't understand my elections, so how can China understand it? That's the first thing. And you must also give grant some intelligence to our politicians. I feel, this is my feeling, and this is not only my feeling, this is also the feeling of many of my friends at my age. And you know, we've conducted elections all over the country in very difficult conditions. They feel that if the Indian politicians and our government employs half the tricks, not even half, one quarter of the tricks and in information warfare which they do during elections on each other, you know, China will be left in the heap. They won't know what hit them. So our elections are very keenly contested. The kind of uh, information warfare which political parties unleash on each other is, has to be seen to be believed. Right, so their ability to this thing is all gone. The very renaming of all these places in Arunachal will ensure that those parties which China thinks it is supporting will fall. They'll have the opposite effect. Whatever China does today in terms of 
trying to influence elections will have the opposite effect, except in a few places. And we have to be clear about that. And those few places are not Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh, don't worry. They are far down in the south, where there is still a communist government in place. There, it, things might uh, have a different viewpoint altogether. Because that's the way that state is constructed even today. Yeah. I think uh, next question. Let's uh, take it. Yes, sir. So next question is about uh, misinformation, spreading the misinformation. And the question is from Rajdeep. He asked that there are many AI apps now av available, like to make AI-generated videos, AI voice, and so forth. And uh, every person in India uses a smartphone, usually, uh, especially in rural India, with not much awareness about how to differentiate between what is AI-generated and what is not. And the question is like, uh, how much extent in the coming election in the future scenario it has pot potential to create chaos among citizens? Look, you have. I've conducted elections in Punjab. I've conducted elections in JNK. I've conducted elections in the Northeast. I've, and you know, in difficult times, one thing you cannot fool the average Indian voter is his ability to see through all this. You know, so. I don't think any influence, any such influence can happen. And the average Indian voter is quite adept and quite, you know, intelligent enough to think what is right for the country and what is not right for the country. Sometime back, long back, I was speaking to a voter and the thing Gyan he gave me was, I said, you, will you, why do you vote def differently in the state and differently for the center? So the simple answer they gave me was, "Tab power na eki admin ya eki party mein to kisi ko dena nahi chahiye. No, alag alag rakho to sahi rahega. Wo kya hai? Wo balance rehta hai. Theek hai na? So santulan rehta hai. So that is the gyan, the native gyan of the Indian voter. I have trust. AI and all. Remember one thing: AI overdoes things. When uh, beyond a point, AI is comes across as artificial. So the naturalness of AI is poor. So to that extent, I'm sanguine things will the, the it will not affect people so badly. So with In fact, yeah. yeah uh, let me put it: it's sure. AI is being used by all sides. All sides. So what comes across is so much AI coming from all sides means that the Indian voter has the capability, it has the capability of seeing everything through and taking a balanced decision, which India has always done. The Indian voter has always done. Remember, so many 75 years, we've had so many transfers of power and absolutely peacefully with no problems whatsoever. You didn't see this happening in the most evolved democracy called USA four years back when there was an insurrection of times such things never happened right we went through a period of emergency and then came out of it oh peacefully because at the end of the day mrs indra gandhi felt the need to go back to the people and no and no party in india can rule india without being democratic okay because every mohalla the parties change so there is no absolute and you must also remember if you see the statistics of, statistics of Indian elections, right? Uh, no party, no party in India has come to power with more than 30% of vote or 30 to 35% of popular vote. Our first past the system uh, kind of election, per, per, right? Uh, does not, it's not like the presidential form of a government where a person you vote for one or the second person. You have so many parties to choose from. Even BJP in the last elections, there's got about 34% popular vote. With 34% popular vote, it got so many seats. So I'm very clear that things will be balanced and influence and all will have its own balance. Yeah. Yes, sir. So with your permission, the next question is uh, to you, sir. Uh, okay. The question is, considering the complexities of regional dynamics in Northeast India, do you perceive a potential threat from China exploiting ethnic disparity to foment, foment internal disruptions, thereby attempting to jeopardize India's internal security? Yeah, that's a very good question and it's a very valid question. I've been serving in 
the Northeast ever since 1980 on and off. And I've seen the change which has happened in, you know, over the years. Uh, let me give you an experience. Way back in 1991, I was in Assam. And there, people spoke to me as if I'm an outsider uh, in Assam. And the same place in Assam, when I went back in 2010, uh, two, not 2010, but 2005, 2006, uh, things were completely different. People have changed. The people have changed. What makes a nation is the people. And when people start changing, you can't stop that change. And I feel that change has happened uh, to a large extent in all parts of the Northeast. Uh, all parts of the Northeast also realize the problem of what is across the border in China. What they also recognize to a large extent the problems of across in a place like Bangladesh with the Islamic influence. Right. And people don't want. And why do people come from Bangladesh into India for a better life? Understand that fundamental thing. So the outside influences are not there. There is a large, in fact, I, I see very few people who don't want to be with India. And to that extent, I am okay. But the problem which I, I see in India is Manipur. Manipur is the problem. And Manipur is the problem because it's a, it went normal. After all, you have to, one has to understand that from Manipur, we have some of our best sportsmen, whether they're hockey players or weightlifters and what have you, and they've got just Olympic medals and gold medals and what have you. And that's a state with a lot of potential. And uh, it's a state which is a multi-ethnic state with cookies, nagas, and uh, metis. It has its divisions. It had its problems. I thought in the past three, four years, things had quietened down. But in the last one year, what has one seen is this thing, uh, you know, uh, coming back due to political uh, ideologies. It's more internal politics than external politics. The thing which make, concerns me a bit is there's strife in Myanmar. And Myanmar, the strife is drug, uh, you know, driven. Drug driven because opium trade in Afghanistan has stopped completely because the Taliban have banned opium in Taliban uh, in Afghanistan. So opium growth has doubled or tripled in Myanmar, and it already had a uh, thriving meth trade. Basically, part of the fentanyl thing, which uh, Madam Cleo Pascal was also talking of. So. Myanmar is a drug driven driven state. The money, everything, politics is, uh, goes around drugs. And a lot of that drug money, uh, the militants in my Manipur are utilizing. So the linkages between drugs and that criminality is going up and, and it has found its uh, you know, shadow in the politics. So that's my worry. I hope after these elections, the you know, once the election and vote catching favor is out, someone gets down and resolves the Manipur problem because it, that's going to be the, a problem. But even there, I don't see an anti-national element coming in. It will be more internal issues. Yep. Uh, so next question is, uh, is from Saurav. And he is asking about uh, India's position toward Taiwan contingency in case of official invasion of Taiwan by China and also unofficial perversion by having close partnership with KMT. Okay. Uh, I mean, the next question should go to uh, Mrs. Uh, Cleo Pascal because it's not fair that you, know, you ask all questions which are oriented towards India. Right. So okay. search one. And I, I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to just listen and learn. So please go ahead. Look, the first thing I must tell you is, I don't think China can invade Taiwan at all. At all. Right. This is my considered opinion, and this considered opinion I've already expressed in a Japanese channel. Okay. I've told them, and I've also put it across why. You know, very recently, why Xi Jinping can't go to war? I did it with P Gurus. It was a joint program, and China can't go to war. If it, China has to go to war, it has to be by accident, not design. If China goes to war by design today, they lose wherever it goes. 
it doesn't matter whether it comes against india philippines uh, japan or uh, taiwan these are the four places it goes and maybe later this week i'm going to give a detailed program as to what are the what are the military aspects of invading taiwan remember from a very broad perspective the taiwan invasion is something like the normandy invasion which took place in the last last century when the allies landed on normandy right in 1944 they ten world something like 7000 ships it involved something like one month of carpet bombing of germany and france it also involved using 18 to 20 ports of you know uh, the uh, west britain west england coast right from southampton to dover everyone so if you see the scale and after that also uh, the allies struggled to go ahead it wasn't a cake walk if taiwan does one tenth i'm saying one tenth of what the germans did against the allies china will flounder the conditions in taiwan for a cross strait invasion against taiwan are much worse okay and the chinese have had no experience whatsoever in amphibious operations the last major amphibious operation in the world was done in falklands when the britishers did they did it 8000 kilometers away they went to malvinas and did what they had to do after that no one has done okay and all these are of the last century today you can't hide this invasion first so whatever happens taiwan is going to hurt china even more now 17 ports you can't hide and if those 17 ports of china are hurt even minimally china's economy will collapse right this whole story is not going to finish one in one day understand the larger issue it's going to take time uh, because wars are not one week affairs like we have re- learned you see already the gaza affair going on for seven months ukraine is going on for two years if taiwan puts up minimal resistance and if this whole thing goes for at least a month or two which it will right that means taiwan straits closes if taiwan straits closes whose economy will get affected the most China's. China's 17 ports, right from Shanghai down to Guangzhou, and even Hainan and everything, will have to pack up. So China's trade will collapse. Okay. Over and above that, all the navies around Taiwan will react. The Yonaguni Island, which is a Japanese island, is just 100 kilometers off Taiwan. The nearest Philippines island is 100 kilometers south of Taiwan, Bashi Strait. Now, if China attacks Taiwan, invariably the japanese forces will react the philippines forces will react they will be forced to react if these two react the Chi- the us forces will also react so in which case taiwan will not be conquered the biggest problem for china is in going across taiwan is how to keep us out of the picture they don't have a method there is no guarantee that the us will not come to aid there is a lot of talk that us will not aid taiwan and all is there a guarantee to it if anything of usa gets hit usa is at war with china will china want that so all this talk about taiwan and all is big talk nothing will happen if for the past 75 years 49 to now nothing has happened you think something is going to happen now especially when the chinese have not had a fight for a long time also you combine it to the fact that for the past 4 years xi jinping and his gang are sitting across in eastern ladakh and they're doing nothing in fact they came big way and they went back 9 kilometers except at debsang and demchok they had to break their own bunkers and go go back 2020 you go back in august those pictures are still live and india has been able to mirror whatever they've done it's a stalemate out there what if china gets into a stalemate in taiwan in taiwan there's no stalemate there's no stalemate in taiwan when you get into the sea you're gone you have to put that boot in the water which china doesn't have the capability to do and it doesn't have the guts to do then what is the impact of a chinese taiwan in i mean in the invasion of taiwan on xi jinping war is a risky affair and what if he goes out of power this that's the second major thing which one has to understand about uh, thing Ta- xi jinping wants to be the 
greatest Chinese in their history, surpassing Mao and uh, Deng Xiaoping. All this is at stake. So China's economy is at stake, its military reputation is at stake, and Xi Jinping's own reputation is at stake. You think he'll put all this and risk go to Taiwan and lose? If you look at it from this point of view, nothing will happen. Now, further, what can you do to prevent it? The more important thing is not Chinese invasion. How do you prevent it? That is the bigger challenge. You prevent it by having better relations with Taiwan. You have prevented by ha by USA generating more. That's what we were discussing. The trilateral, which is now going to emerge between Japan, Philippines, and USA, is very significant for Taiwan. It's not only really significant for them because that trial, if China is going to upset that trilateral, China is in trouble. So all these things put together, things are not so bad that China can do anything it wants. In fact, if anything, China can do nothing it wants today. And you also have to see today, today morning, I just downloaded certain data of China from Chinese sources. I'm not talking of China from Forbes or Newsweek and things like that. I'm talking of Chinese sources. Their imports are down, their exports are down. Okay. So it's not, China is declining. I mean, the Chinese threat will in, decrease, increase for different purposes, but China per se is declining. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The next question is about India-Taiwan military collaboration. And the question is, what are collaboration taking place between Indian and Taiwanese military? And citing last year's three former defense chiefs visited Taiwan and had a closed door meeting. OK, look, that uh, the military cooperation between Taiwan and India is very low. Let me be very honest with you. It, it, it's just this kind of exchange which is happening. For the simple reason, the Taiwan-US military relation is very strong. You have to understand that all Taiwanese officers, most of the Taiwanese officers are trained in, you know, USA. In USA, a lot of in, uh, interaction takes place with Taiwan. That is as it may at this point of time. But is there a scope to increase the relationship? Yes. It has to be in stages. It can't be immediate. It has to be stage-wise. Uh, is there a plan in a foot? I think so. Right? Many things are not in the open domain. And I can't speak also the same. But things are happening. It's not as if things are not happening. And we also have to understand that Taiwan feels itself as vulnerable. Taiwan itself is vulnerable. Okay? Because Taiwan does, is not a state, but it is a country with elections and it's you know uh, a rich country good country uh, very dynamic country dynamic people the thinking is different if you i've interacted with the taiwanese here also in chennai with the, their consulate they're in a state where they have a consulate here but they can't call it a, a consulate they call it a center a cultural center or something like that so they're caught actually so they wouldn't like to overtly increase their uh, you know contact with india you also have to understand we also can't go beyond a point overtly for the simple reason notwithstanding all our problems with china we have a huge trade dependency on china you can't wish it away you can't wish it away because that that trade dependency is because of the primary materials which you need from china okay and api active pharmaceutical in the ingredients that is the bulk of the trade with china Unless you get those APIs, you cannot value add and have a thriving pharma industry, right? We are supposed to be the pharmacy of the world. That pharmacy won't function if you don't get materials from China. So you have a trade going with China. I mean, it is not as if you can wish it away. Are we doing something to reduce that? We are. Will it happen overnight? It will not happen overnight. It will take another a decade for that to reverse. Have you started on that progress? Yes. So if you take all these things into consideration, there are limitations with what we can do with Taiwan. But what we can do with Taiwan is increase Taiwan-India trade, which is happening. The prime example of that is Foxconn. Now, Foxconn has shifted here uh, along with Apple to set up factories here. Okay. 
and soon more others will follow so once that happens things will start changing that's how it uh, is and probably with if when elon musk or uh, tesla start setting up factories here and maybe something from taiwan will automatically come because i'm sure certain components of the entire uh, supply chain of uh, tesla come from originate from taiwan so things will improve it will take time but thank you sir and the next question sir is there was a report by india's intelligence bureau in 2014 stating the negative role of foreign funded ngos in india's developmental activities costing us about 2 to 3 percentage of gdp growth it was evident from the farmers protest in the same way there are reports of china's inclusion in american universities how can we tackle this in the era of fourth generation warfare you have to understand that as india rises these attempts will be there both from china and from the west the we have to be very clear as you rise and as you become autonomous and uh, self dependent china will try to contain you and the west as a whole us and europe largely will try to peg you down that is their colonial mentality which they have not let go they have to come to terms with the fact that look india is breaking free of polish shackles and that is something which you know your generation might not have experienced my generation has experienced i have gone through it after all i started uh, my life in a british mindset we broke out of that came now we are in a completely indian mindset okay so that will happen we have to contend with it and in any case any uh, country which is whether it is developed or it is rising will have to contend with these outside influences i mean you have to become internally strong for that okay whether it's the farmers protest look look let, let me ask you a rhetorical question why did the farmers protest take place it is not as if that the farmers protest didn't have problems they or the protests were not genuine they were genuine to a large extent but the fact is whenever such genuine protest takes place they'll get hijacked and that's what happened in the farmers protest okay uh, because i mean i i can go into a discussion why the farmers protest took place msp a all that but the fact is that unless we learn to solve all problems with by giving level playing fields to our people i'm talking of people i'm not talking of organizations ngos and all unless we level the playing field for our own people we'll have these problems and we also have to realize as india transforms and rises it's nice to say india rising a wall that we have a whole huge disparity in india which exists right and this disparity gives rise to completely lopsided playing fields in our quest for going up now i might sound like a leftist but you need to look at it from the problem of the poorest indian as we grow in this thing there's more of uh, disparity growing between the rich and the poor and that will give rise to problems whether we like it or not okay unless we are able to bring the poorest indian up to standard we will have these problems going we have to lift people out of their poverty it is not as if india has been doing it and remember sometime back this about 8 to 10 years back that we they said that every year india lifts one australia out of poverty it's a tremendous achievement okay but is it enough no because people are still there a lot of people are there who are still below the poverty line so this disparity itself will give way or give space for others to talk in between and do what they have to do and this is something we have to contend with which means that we need to have governments which are uh, in respect to the party governments which are stable and democratic by nature not by you know uh words alone you have to and the good part is this you know, whether the bjp is right and the congress is left or otherwise is a eclectic debate but you see that performance on ground both the governments have performed left of center 
the left of center is what their actual performance has been okay when when the prime minister when mr modi who's a rightist the bjp is a right leading uh, setup but he talks of giving uplifting the poor and f- giving free food for the poor free gas for the poor building urinals and toilets for the poor what is he doing he's occupying the left space which is required in a country like ours till such time we come to a level where we are okay but then you look at uh, the most developed country like usa there also there's a left of center space because as capitalistic and as rich as usa is there are a lot of people who are in their terms below the poverty line which need uplifting you go to midwest Af- uh, uh, usa things are bad right uh, i went to a place which i called the bihar of usa okay uh, i'll not name the state because that's not correct but the situation there was like that there are townships which and uh, villages which have poverty there real poverty okay so you can't wish this problem away as we go up the value chain that's the way i look at it yeah so we are taking one last question by evan yeah. and uh, the question is directed towards you uh, it's uh, regarding the influx of young chinese migrants entering the united states by the mexican border and their potential role in internal disruption if not worthy in light of this do you perceive a strategic utilization by china to leverage these migrants as agent to sow discord within american universities particularly concerning global issues such as israel hamas conflict and potentially to exacerbate anti indian sentiment sorry is that from for me yeah okay. yeah okay yeah okay great right. um so according to the uh, 2017 national intelligence law in china every chinese citizen and chinese organization uh, has to support um chinese and that means chinese communist party activities especially in in the intelligence realm so uh, if they have any family back in china or any business linkages back in china they're uh, controllable and um if they've if they've left china china's kept track of them you don't easily just leave china so they may have come into the us easily but they didn't leave china easily um and uh they 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 know what's expected of them uh so in some in in some cases they may not be directed uh in other cases um they may be more directed and we're also we're seeing it also by the way um there the united states has possessions in the pacific including uh, the commonwealth of northern mariana islands which shares a maritime boundary with japan that it's us territory with us citizens and it's so far deep into the pacific it shares a boundary with japan and the commonwealth of northern marianas um chinese can arrive there without a visa they can just get off the plane for short term tourism without a visa this is a a legacy of a, an attempt to promote tourism in in that area it resulted in the setting up of chinese linked casinos that were running more money through them than the casinos in macau it's a very uh, un- unfortunate situation to put it mildly and there've been cases of hundreds hundreds within the last few months of the of chinese who have been then illegally taking boats into guam from the commonwealth of northern marianas and showing up on on US military bases wandering around US military bases where they get stopped and then handed over to the FBI but we've also seen that in California on main in in the mainland in the US mainland so um you know of of the however many there are tens of thousands who've come into the US um like say 1% are bad actors like probably more but that's still a lot of people and um uh very difficult to track so they don't have to the ones that you were talking about that are going on to the university campuses they're coming in as exchange students and th- that's a different overt pathway and um 
it, I think it's not a coincidence that you'll see um, the same intersectionality, which is sort of what it's known as groupings that are um, against Israel, against India, uh, against, um, you know, certain groupings within the U.S. Uh, coming together to um, support each other. So I've, I can tell you, I consistently hear in the U.S. Uh, from people who should know better about how um, how repressive India is against uh, minorities, and um, and I always ask, give me an example, <laughs> and and uh, there's often very little concrete example they can give. It's just something that they've heard in this miasma of discussions that's floating around the universities and in the media. Um, and um, I think that there, we mentioned the two groups that want to um, you know, make India not viable as a country, and they come together uh, definitely on the university campuses in the US. India isn't the only target, but India is again, as we talked about with China, and as India becomes more important, you're going to be attracting more attention from China. I think you're going to be attracting more attention um, from the sort of people that you're seeing on the campuses uh, doing the kind of demonstrating that they're doing now. And uh, I, I, you can, you could feel that it was they're trying to build it up in the lead up to the elections, but it's not gaining as much traction as they would want. But it's definitely still um, an effort, and it, I don't think it's something that's going to go away, unfortunately. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I request Sir and Cleo Pascal, ma'am, to give their concluding remarks. Yeah, madam, all yours. Okay, <laughs> good. I didn't. I didn't want to say the actual last word because um, uh, I, I, I'm very, just very grateful for the opportunity uh, to to be able to chat a little bit, but mostly uh, to learn. These were good questions, good, solid, to the point questions, and um, that's uh, one of India's great strengths which is this the ability to discuss openly, get right to the heart of the issue, and to have um, an engaged younger generation that's willing to, to learn from uh, the very experienced um, uh, older generation that knows the trajectory of the country and can uh, give a clear view of not only where it's been, but where it can head. Uh, if some of these threats are are dealt with in the way that they should be dealt with. So um, I'd just like to say thank you. And um, looking forward to the real last word. Over to you, sir. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, madam. Uh, at the outset, I must thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to talk all of you with all of you and converse with Mrs. Pia Pascal. It's been a pleasure. Uh, as far as our country is concerned, our country is on the change. And let me tell you, and I'm very you know, bullish about India, because India is restituting it to its past. If you read jo uh, you know, Joseph Kennedy's book, Rise and Fall of Empires, it's very clear that you know, India and China at some point of time uh, occupied a large portion of the world economy. And we are just going back there, right? China has already reached that place. It may be in the next say, 15, 20, 30 years, you'll see the shift which is happening. The only difference is that China will start declining. And China will start declining only for one reason, because of its one-child policy. Because it's, it's irreversible. And when people decline, the number of people in a place decline, its economy will start going down. So somewhere towards another you know, 15, 20, in fact, in the next five years, this differential in you know uh, power will start showing up very much it's already started and that is why we are talking on th these terms in the next five years it's going to be pronounced in the next 10 years 15 years i think it will be absolutely marked and we will be there right I, that's the way i look at it and in this the role of the youth is huge okay 
and the role of the youth is huge in taking this country forward without the next generation taking this country forward we are going nowhere and everyone that's the way we look at it and the more important thing is it's nice to understand the world i think all of us have to understand ourselves we have to understand what india is we have to understand what a indian who lives in gujarat is what a, i have to understand what a indian who lives in manipur is and what a indian who lives in jnk is and what a indian who lives in kanyakumari is okay that is something which many of us lack we don't understand what india is we evaluate men- india most of us indians evaluate india from the metrics around us in the environment which we which we live but there are 10 different indias living outside your own bubble the day we can get the understanding of these 10 different indias then by going there right by going there it is not by reading about it you have to go there and understand this country of yours right and spend some time even if you go for fun out there it's good enough right and, and india has a lot of fun let me tell you this and it's very cheap fun and that's why it's good okay you will we will all grow together better and i've been lucky i you know my uh, profession has taken me to all parts of india where i have a clear understanding what india is people talk of poverty in india but let me tell you i've seen people with absolutely no income living well in where they are living and they're living in a jungle and they're living off the land and with very little needs and they're very happy from a western or any other prism that fellow is living below poverty line x y z but he's actually living probably at times a better life than you and i are leading so mm. it's a matter of perspective unless you see that india and you understand that india you will not we will not be the power that we are but having said that we need to develop there's no doubt about it and that is a largely an internal affair an internally strong india will project more strength outside than anything else when in india grows internally strong automatically people will start adjusting to it and you'll see you know this business of interference by china or by ngos or whoever you call them will reduce because they their their power reduces and how do you do that is by better education better science better technology and better empathy towards each other better tolerance towards each other's religions better way of looking at life as a fellow indian and a fellow human being rather than anything else when you look at it outside india also we will be a better india if we can take all our neighbors along because india which grows without its neighbors is going to be a problematic india just think if there's a you know what happens to a skyscraper with slums all around that won't be a happy skyscraper so similarly all the countries around us have to grow along with us that is something we have to learn to take them along and only then india will be a stronger india right and at this i'll uh, leave it at that a stronger india is a stronger internal india which comes from all of you young people all the best and wish you all the very best thank you thank you sir thank you ma'am uh, with this we have come to an end of this insightful and timely discussion I, on behalf of Indic Researchers Forum, would like to thank General P. R. Shankar Sir and Cleo Pascal Ma'am for their insightful talk. Also, grateful to our audience for attending the session. The recording of this session will be uploaded on Gunner Short and Indic Researchers Forum's YouTube channel in the next 48 hours. The transcript of this discussion will be published in the second edition of our Two and a Half Front Security publication. The link to the inaugural edition and the YouTube channels are mentioned in the chat box. I would also take this opportunity to inform you all that the next month Indic Researchers Forum is organizing a one day online conference on the topic civil society as a new frontier of the world. We invite everyone to join us for the conference. For more details please follow our social media handles. That's it from my end. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you sir. Thank you ma'am. Thank you very much.